And now a quick word from our sponsor. Many consider Renaissance Technologies Medallion Fund one of the best hedge funds of all time. From 1988 through 2018, the fund returned 66% per year. That means if you invested $10,000 in 1988, you could have cashed out with over $200 million 30 years later. The secret sauce? Algorithms. Medallion is run by an army of computer scientists, mathematicians, and neural engineers that build investing algorithms designed to eliminate typical human biases. And it makes sense. Most investors regret making impulsive investment decisions. But unless you're a PhD wielding Python coding Excel wizard, Algo Investing has largely been out of reach for the average investor until now. Introducing Composer.Trade, a no-code platform for building and investing in Algo strategies. Composer.Trade is putting the power of quant into the hands of regular investors with their game-changing app. With Composer.Trade, you can invest in strategies like Sector Momentum or the Dalio that execute trades automatically, depending on market movements. You can even build your own strategy from scratch with their drag-and-drop portfolio editor. I interviewed Composer CEO Ben Rollert in episode 409 back in April and was impressed with what I heard. There's a reason why over $1 trillion is managed by quantitative hedge funds, and Composer.Trade lets you trade like the pros for a fraction of the price. Put the power of quant in your portfolio and get one month free by going to Composer.Trade slash MEB. That's Composer.Trade slash MEB. See important disclaimers at Composer.Trade slash disclaimer. And now, back to the show. Jason, welcome to the show. Happy to be here, man. Last time I saw you, Manhattan Beach? Where was it? Yeah, we're having some dinner and drinks with you, me, Toby, and my partner, Taylor. It was a great time. Good dinner, good drinks, good people, good times. Always love Manhattan Beach. Well, come on back. I don't want to jinx it. We're trying to get a putting in an LOI on an office that you can see the ocean from. So listeners, come see us. Hopefully by the time this drops, we'll be moving there. You're a real estate guy. We'll get into that in a minute. In Manhattan Beach or El Segundo? In Manhattan Beach. There's not too many offices there. It's all like 70s surf porn style. <laughs> like the carpets are gross. It's old. Like it just, you know, it's funky. We actually looked at Mike Tyson's old office, Tyson Ranch in El Segundo, amazing they put some real money into that had a boxing ring in the middle but it's his cannabis company so we didn't take that one we're trying to get closer to the water anyway for people that don't live in california you would think we have the, all this pristine real estate and everything but most of it's 50 to 70s absolute garbage especially closer by the beach and you have like terrible walls with no insulation no ac no heat you know like you said terrible carpet like it's it's hard to find grade a quality office space on the coast. That AC discussion is a little too close to home. We just renovated our house and it took forever, but we have an AC unit sitting in our garage for quite some time and it's not plugged in yet because of permitting process, which is a whole nother discussion. And my wife is a stickler, wants to do it by the books. I'm like, let's just plug it in. In September, we can unplug. I don't care, but it's so hot in here. Anyway, we haven't had ACs for 10 years. I don't know why it matters now. It's just the knowledge that it's there and can't use it is what bothers me. You got a background for those who are listening to this on audio only of 22 Steps to Make Wine. Where are you today? Give us a little insight. This is exciting for me because it's a long time list of your podcast. I know how good you are at coming up with anecdotes to relate to the guests based on where they say they're, they're coming to you from. So I can't wait to hear this one today. So I am sitting at home in the heart of Napa Valley in, in the most beautiful wine country in the world. And so this is where we find myself today. Yeah, there's 22 steps to make wine in the background. My favorite meme video before the word meme was was really around, and we'll put this in the show note links, listeners, you got to watch it, was the famous one. I don't know if you've ever seen it, the girl stomping grapes in Napa, and she falls out of the grape tank. Have you seen this? And, yes. starts, and starts screaming, <laughs> poor lady. Anyway, listeners, we'll add it to the show note links. You always been a Napa guy? How long have you been there? It's been about 13 years now. So I grew up in Michigan, have lived all over the US, all over the world, but I've been living here in paradise for about 13 years. And yeah, it's pretty amazing. And actually, you'll appreciate this as a Californian, it's actually just starting to rain right now. And so it's nice to get these rains when we can get them as far as like mitigating the drought and, and wildfires. So I know your story, but I want to spend a little time with it for listeners, because I think it really almost more than any guest informs what you're doing now 
I mean, everyone's life experiences take them to where they are, but some more kind of directly than others. I actually spent, you don't know this, but listeners, Jason has a great podcast and YouTube series that he co-hosts with Corey on the YouTube. What are the names of it? Give us the... Pirates of Finance with Corey Hofstein. And Corey wears various robes and sort of odd outfits on, glasses of the week. And then what is the podcast? The YouTube shows Pirates of Finance. And then with my firm, Mutiny Funds, we do the Mutiny Investing podcast as well. And yeah, just various podcasts and interviews here and there. So like you, I'm just always on the mic, it feels like. And we see you from time to time on Real Vision as well. However, I spent my birthday with you. You don't know this because we were homeless and still renovating for six months when it was supposed to be two. And we were in Candlewood Lake, Connecticut. And it was my birthday. And so to escape my family and children and in-laws, families and children, I went kayaking. And then there was a little bar all the way across the lake and i was like there's no way i could take the kayak way all the way over there but i started listening to a podcast you did i think it was with real vision but it was like your four trades or something oh yeah yeah but i started paddling and then i was like well i can't stop now because i want to listen to this and so i paddled all the way across the lake luckily i didn't get murdered because it was july 4th weekend got to the bar had a frozen mudslide. It's probably the best frozen mudslide I've had in my life. And then paddled back. It was a very pleasant day, Jason. You were uh, tell a good story. So I don't want to recreate that, but I do want to hear a little bit of your timeline because you are not always a what you are today. I was. I don't know what to describe you as. <laughs> I was as waiting. A, to, I was waiting. I hope you would tell me because when people ask me what I do, yeah, you're not always a cockroach guy. But give us the origin story. Sure. So, you know, we're the same age. So actually when people always ask this, I don't know about you, but in my head, it runs through Goonies and Chunk. Like when I was six, I pushed my sister down the stairs. It's like, where do you want me to start kind of thing? I've always been an entrepreneur. I also was a soccer player. I was fortunate enough to play soccer all over Europe, South America, the United States as a kid. Ended up going to the IMG Academy, playing soccer there and graduating from there. And then went on to play soccer at College of Charleston in South Carolina. I was initially like an international business major, found that kind of boring because, I mean, it just all made perfect sense to me growing up in a family of entrepreneurs. And then so I switched my major to comparative religions. So I studied especially like Eastern mysticism, those sorts of things. Post-college, decided to work on, you know, my entrepreneurial skill set. I started a commercial real estate development company in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, I've developed, you know, some buildings along that King Street corridor, um, that beautiful thoroughfare that goes right through the heart of Charleston. And then just got absolutely wrecked in the GFC of 2007, 2008. Totally blew up. It changed the course of my life pretty dramatically. After that, I tried to figure out there has to be a way to hedge entrepreneurial risk. As an entrepreneur and having a lot of friends are entrepreneurs, it doesn't matter how idiosyncratically good you are as an entrepreneur if you have a global macro liquidity event like we had in 2007, 2008, because you're trying to build projects years in the future. And so you need there to be less volatility and more certainty in the future, not, not less of either. And so, or more volatility and less uncertainty. And so then I spent the better part of the next decade figuring out how to trade options, how to trade VIX futures, trying to figure out all these ways to be long volatility and hedge tail risks. And just felt that there's got to be a way to hedge that entrepreneurial risk, even though people don't think it's possible. I happen to think it is. And, and you can use some of that macro liquidity kind of issues to hedge entrepreneurial risk. Obviously, you're taking basis risk, but I think it allows us to be have a tool for entrepreneurship where we can be much more aggressive at what we're really good at and try to hedge some of those global macro liquidity risks. So in 2018, some across my partner, Taylor Pearson, we started chatting online, started talking about all things related to markets and volatility. We both had a mutual love for a lot of Chris Cole white papers about volatility. So we started talking about, you know, even though I've been building these total portfolio solutions kind of based on the, the Harry Brown permanent portfolio model, but doing it in a more modern sense, and you and I, I'm sure we'll get into that, is the idea was, well, these are all well and good, but I think a modern version of Harry Brown permanent portfolio requires things like long volatility, tail risk, commodity trend managers. And most retail people have zero access to that. And so even though I knew how to build those for myself and my family, 
just figured there had to be a way to offer retail clients more access to products like this. And so that's what Taylor and I got together about is like, look, if you want to have some access to long velocity and tail risk, there's a lot of path dependencies that you need to cover. So you're going to need like an ensemble approach to those path dependencies to do it well. And we figured out if we could, you know, aggregate a lot of accredited retail investors together, we could provide access to the, the best in breed managers and try to create a ensemble beta-like return from these spaces. So Taylor and I set about to do that in 2020. We launched our long volatility strategy, starting with five managers. We're up to 14 managers now. And then in September of last year, we hit the goal I've been working on for about 10 years of, of launching our cockroach fund. And the idea with cockroach fund is something that's after your own heart of owning all the world's asset classes and rebalancing. But the cockroach fund basically has global stocks, global bonds, a long volatility ensemble, a commodity trend ensemble, and we also have gold and cryptocurrencies as well. So yeah, the idea is to try to build the least shitty portfolios so people can manage their savings and no matter kind of what the global macro environment throws at them. I love the Harry Brown 2.0. So for listeners, Harry Brown, permanent portfolio, decades old, was, and you can correct me, 25% stocks, bonds, cash, gold. Was that the original? permanent portfolio. And, and there's been some spins on it. But like you mentioned, you know, if you historically model the Harry Brown portfolio, it's a pretty good portfolio. It's lower return because of the huge portion in cash and bonds. But it's one of the more stable across decade portfolios because of the particularly the gold allocation, which has been doing F all for the past number of years. Like you said, like, to me, the modern version is like, instead of cash, what if you use like long volatility and terrorists that gave you a much more convex cash position to kind of offset the stock exposure. And then instead of just gold, like you said, which is a singular path dependency for people would say inflation, but maybe purchase power parity over multi-decade or multi-century cycles is like, instead of gold, why don't we use commodity trend followers that can you know trade 80 to 100 commodity markets? And that's a better ballast in an inflationary environment or maybe a better beta to really offset the the disinflationary bucket of bonds. So that's why we say a modern version of Harry Brown's permanent portfolio. But like, as you know, you've put it out there is like, this goes back to the Talmud. Even our pitch deck, it's got a shout out to you in there because we go all the way back to the timeline to the Talmud. Obviously we think that Harry Brown's work was the seminal work in like 1972-ish. Even before that, Alfred Winslow Jones, you know, started with hedged funds because they went long and short and people kind of forget that. And so the other one we so we include on our timeline, we include your Trinity portfolio and Chris Cole's Dragon portfolio along those timelines for really adapting those to more modern usages. Yeah. The insightful thing that you had was thinking about risks. I mean, obviously you had to go hand to stove face to fire, I don't even know what that analogy you want, head in the toilet, you know, experience to kind of go through it. And most, if not all, older traders and investors have at some point, and often it informs your path, which is one of the reasons I'm a quant, certainly imploded all my money in the dot-com bust. Looking back on it, you know, on, on trying to think about risks, do you think some of the ideas today would have helped? And in particularly, like, what would have helped most in that scenario? If you could go back and talk to 20-something Jason. Well, talking to 20-something Jason, I would find very annoying because he'd just be optimistic and transigent, wouldn't listen to this this old guy speaking to him now. So that's part of it. But yeah, the idea is what I don't think anybody's really talked about with these broadly diversified portfolios as much, especially like to say the Harry Brown portfolio, even above that at the 30,000 foot level, we like to talk about it as combining offense and defense. And so people don't realize that like, you know, a 60, 40 portfolio that most people have as a target date fund, and that's their broad diversification is just offense. You and I know in rising GDP environments, you know, risk on environments, you know, 60, 40 is going to do just fine. And then when we have these liquidity events or recessions, you know, correlations go to one and these things don't do well. And so when people are offered a portfolio, even if they're diversifying into VC, PE, real estate, all of these different things, those are all still long GDP, therefore like offensive assets that are really do, as long as we have a wash of liquidity and risk on, they do great. So we really think about it at the top level is like you really want to balance your offensive and defensive assets. The idea of what this would help me prior to 2007, 2008 
in the sense that by adding long volatility tail risk, commodity trend managers, maybe a little bit of gold and cryptocurrencies, by adding all of those defensive assets with your offensive assets, that allows you to survive. Like, I, I feel like I'm going to quote back to you, you a bunch of times on this podcast, like the only form of actual winning in this game is surviving. That's the way we have to play the game, because as long as you can stay in the game where most people blew up, blow up and they get kicked out of the game. So yeah, the surviving is the only success in this business. I was thinking about this before we got on. You know, when if I think about like the the Buffets, the Mungers, the Marks, Mobison, O'Shaughnessy, and I'm going to throw you in this bucket just to embarrass you for a second, is at some point when you're in this game for decades, do you feel you would just automatically start coalescing down towards just being almost like a Taoist with your aphorisms? Because like you've seen so much that it really just comes down to really the basics. Like I'm saying like offense plus defense or surviving where it's like everybody wants to talk about this individual equity thesis they have, but it's more like, what is your broader framework for constructing a portfolio and can you survive? Yeah. And I think a good analogy for that too, for the finance peeps on here or the product issuers. I mean, so many times I'll see someone launch a fund and then a, a pop-up will come like fund close after one year. And I was like, why, in the, like, did you not build a five, minimum of five, but realistically a 10 year time horizon? Because one year is just a coin flip. Like you have no idea. There's a quote from uh, Ken French, who's the French and Fama French listeners. He had a couple of amazing quotes from a podcast he did couple years ago, but he says, people are crazy when they try and draw inferences that they do from three, five, or even 10 years on an asset class or an actively managed fund. And let that sink in listeners. So I'm just going to delete the three and five. People are crazy when they try and draw inferences, I mean, it's conclusions from 10 years on an asset class or actively managed fund. And how many, every survey one after another shows people looking at one to three years at the most. I mean, like if you even survived that long, three being like the end of the <laughs> possible time horizon. He's like crazy if you even look at it at 10. Yeah, that's why I think about all those behavioral risks. Is And this is what my partner and I talk about all the time is like, you have to keep people, like you were saying, surviving. So by having defensive assets, you allow people to not make stupid mistakes and jumping in and out of funds at the most inopportune times. So that's like the biggest thing we think about. And then going back to like your question of like, you know, pre-2007, Jason, you know, or, you know, mid-20s year old Jason, you know, what would have this defensive assets help me? Absolutely. But the other thing that we like to talk about and think about is, as I said, this is a tool to hedge entrepreneurial risk, even though it's, it is a complete total portfolio solution for an investment portfolio of your savings. But the idea is you have to think about your life a lot more holistically. And as an entrepreneur, you know, you have all this long GDP, you know, risk on assets. And most people don't think about that. So as soon as you have any savings left over after consumption that you don't need to put back into your business, you actually need to be solely investing in defensive assets. And I think your paper that I share all the time, that's my favorite, is that like financial advisors are almost quadruple levered long to spy, but people don't realize that. And so like as an entrepreneur is actually I shouldn't be, you know, even looking to buy more stocks and bonds. I should only be looking for defensive assets to hedge the risk that I'm building with my business. And I'll let you kind of go into like what the quadruple leverage is for financial advisors. The first step, which you hit upon having gone through it, but so many people also hit upon in hindsight, which is usually the way we learn, right, is I need to start thinking about risks, but all risks and particularly one specific to your life and situation. And, and so many people, it automatically defaults and they think about it when it comes to certain things. They think about it when it comes to car insurance, they think about it when it comes to house insurance, those type of manageable risks. Portfolios, it's like for some behavioral reason that just goes out the window. And the Forex topic you're referencing was your average financial advisor is four times leverage the stock market and doesn't know it. You know, he has his own money and I'm saying he, because all the financial advisors are men, but he or she has all their money invested in U S stocks of their portfolio. Maybe they have 60, 40, but the 60 dominates the 40 in volatility and drawdowns. They have their clients portfolios invested. So his revenue is directly tied to 
U.S. stocks. And so as that goes down, if it gets cut in half, your revenues get cut in half. The business, which he's associated with, you know, if you don't own your own business, you're exposed to recessions and layoffs. And lastly, of course, clients go crazy when they lose a bunch of money and they withdraw. So it's a compounding effect. And so you can make the argument, and I did this on Twitter the other day, that theoretically you should or could own no U.S. stocks at all. And I don't know a single person that does that. Do you know anybody like that an investor that's U.S. based that owns zero? I don't know a single one. No, not nobody that's domestic. Yeah. I, I think pretty profoundly, this is a good idea for a blog post. You can make that argument that they shouldn't own any anyway. Yeah. I feel like I'm the outlier on all your Twitter polls. Like when you ask like, who owns global, who owns emerging market stocks, who owns commodities? I'm like always raising my hand of like the one idiot in the crowd that's like your outlier. Where'd you fall on my most recent one? My most recent poll was, has inflation top ticked? Have we seen the high print inflation for the cycle or no? I think it was 9-1. Yeah. The best part I think about, and you know this, you're you know trolling people when you do this, is like when we construct portfolios the way you and I do, is we don't know. And that's the whole point is like, how do you construct a portfolio when you retired from the crystal ball game, when you know you can't predict the future? And so it's fun for us to play this, you know, what's your opinion, but hopefully it doesn't affect our portfolio construction. And that's kind of the point, the way I see it. Okay. So we got a little background. You got smashed in real estate. By the way, how has Charleston real estate done since then? Is that like on the regret list? Like it's up there with Bitcoin or what? Man, you are the first person that's asked me that, but you are te- you are so correct. I mean, it is ridiculous. It is ridiculous how much it's appreciated since then. I went down recently for a pandemic wedding, meaning like they got married during the pandemic, but had the party. And my goodness, I mean, Charleston, you always read the magazines everywhere. It's like one of the best cities in the world. And it's great. But like the expansion into like Mount Pleasant and all those restaurants and bars and everything, like just on and on and on world-class city. Can you imagine when I moved there in 97, there wasn't a single chain store on King Street and you didn't ever go like north of Calhoun. Like it literally changes so much every two to three years. It's like going into a different city. Did it go through some stressors during the pandemic? Were you like, hold on a second, maybe I should get back involved in this? Or you're just like, no, I am never going to that city again in my life. I try not to, except for my brother actually opened a restaurant there during the pandemic. So I've been back a few times to visit his restaurant. So, I mean, yeah, he has that courage to kind of step into that fray. Did he make it through? Yeah. Yep. They're still open and running. It's a Coterie on Warren Street. It's a fusion. And, you know, usually I hate fusion restaurants, but it's a great fusion between Indian cuisine and low country cuisine. They blend really well together. Yeah. My brother was a craft cocktail bartender in, in Mumbai for a few years setting up restaurants there. So he's got the background to kind of put those two together. God, that sounds delicious. <laughs> exactly. That's, that's like my two favorite foods. I'm trying to figure out how that works, but Southern food, I would definitely be 250 if I lived in the South at this point. I don't think I have the off switch. I can't take sweet tea anymore though. It's too sweet for me. I'm like one quarter sweet and I feel really bad ordering that embarrassing. Be like, can you just give me like a smidgen of sweet and the rest unsweet? But I got a bunch of boiled peanuts in my closet that I got to cook. All right. So went through that experience, forever seared in your brain. Was concentration and leverage a piece of that or just not so much? Yeah, no, I, I think it is every time in the sense that that's the best part. The best part about real estate and the worst part about real estate is that leverage and then the illiquidity. You know, a lot of times you can get a nice illiquidity premium. I know that you've talked a lot about these days, but you know, when you're a young entrepreneur and you don't have context to really know better is using probably an extreme amount of leverage, especially in commercial real estate or real estate in general. You can, that's why everybody loves that asset classes because they get leverage and it's marked to model. But if you're selling condos or you're renovating properties and you have all of these different time cycles and you need to align with the time cycles you have with your bank for, you know, your loans, your balloon payments, et cetera, if you're highly leveraged going into that situation, which I was, and so it's entirely my fault in hindsight, is if you're expecting, you know, these projects to come to fruition over the next one, two, three, four years, and they're all staggered out and you have an amount of leverage on them, but then 2007 happens. It's always interesting. Commercial real estate guys will say, oh, seven stock market people will say, oh, eight, but you know, like that's the difference. So what would happen is, and people don't realize this, it went from mark to model to almost mark to market overnight. Because if let's just say you're redeveloping a building that has condos in it. So you're renovating, it's got 20 condo units, but people have put down a deposit. Uh, let's say five to 10% of the purchase price. 
2007 happens, you're waiting to close and finish those apartments. So that way, therefore, you know, you can close on those loans, you could pay off your bank and pay off your investors, et cetera. But then 2007 happens and those people just walk away from those apartments. They walk away from those deposits. Like you're just left holding nothing at that point. So then that leverage gets manifested both ways. So the leverage worked unbelievably well on the way up, but then on the way down, you're completely wiped out. But the unique structure of, let's say, commercial real estate is you have that light equity tranche that you're basically levered up. So if the structure of your deal falls apart and people walk away from their just deposits, then you can't really make your balloon payments with the bank. So therefore, the way the contract is structured is actually the building goes back to the bank. That's the structure of the contract. What I find fascinating is that the banks didn't like that when it did happen. But I was like, it's in black and white. It's in the contract. Basically, they wanted risk-free interest. That's what the banks thought going into 2007, right? They were happy to leverage up all these deals because they never thought they were going to have to actually take back the properties. They weren't doing a, a necessarily the best job at underwriting. But it's interesting is like you have a contractual obligation. If I don't fulfill my side of the contract, here are the keys. You can take back the building. And none of them wanted to do so. And I was like, it was really interesting to see their reactions in the sense, now looking back a little bit circumspect about it to see that they didn't want to live up to their contractual obligation. And it was interesting when they got into it. I don't think they were assessing what could happen if they had to take back the keys. You walk forward, you go to a silent treat in a monastery for five years in Nepal. Wasn't there something in between, by the way? Weren't you living in Mexico or somewhere? Yeah, I've lived in a lot of places. I lived all over the world. So yeah, what happened also to just add insult to injury is because I was so tapped into like the residential mortgage side, I could see the kind of cracks in the walls. And I was a little bit worried in oh, late 06 going into 07. And I remember even asking, you know, I got together all these older real estate developers, all like over 50, 60 years old, like seven, eight guys, some of the biggest developers in the Charleston area. And I said, look, I'm concerned here. Should I be worried? And to a man, they said, no, this time's different. Now, what I had to find out in hindsight is that obviously <laughs> real estate de developers are preternaturally optimists and they don't mind about declaring bankruptcy and starting over again. So I should have known who I was talking to, but I didn't have the context to understand that. But so what I said, I was tapped into kind of those mortgage market what's going on. So as soon as I started seeing real problems in 2007, I knew exactly who the worst lenders were on the mortgage side. And so like, you know, those Countrywide, WashMu, all those, you know, names that we've all forgotten since. So I actually started buying put options against those mortgage providers. But because I was not a professional options trader and didn't know my options well, I had to learn hard lessons about options Greek. So even though I bet on the housing collapse, I actually lost money on those trades because I didn't realize time horizons, theta, vega. This is how I had to learn even an even more painful lesson. So even though I called the housing crash, I actually lost money buying op put options on the housing crash. So it was adding insult to injury. So what you're referencing is it probably took another couple of years where you know I went down to Mexico to live cheaply, kind of lick my wounds, trying to figure out what I wanted to do next, trying to figure out what happened. I mean, it was like, uh, not to over dramatize, but like you're essentially in the fetal position on the floor because it's one thing to lose your own money, but as soon as you start losing family and friends money, it's the worst feeling in the world. And you go from this idea that like, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. And, you know, when we're young, we have so much hubris. And I, I, you know, you think you start to think you're a genius. And then the market shows you that you are lucky. And then you have a existential crisis where you have to figure out, am I a complete moron? You know, is there any skill sets I have? What should I do with my life? I mean, it was really that dramatic. And it's easier to say it now and laugh about it. But it was an intense few year period of figuring out trying to rebuild myself from scratch, so to speak. I was really going to depress you because, and I can't find it, but we'll post it to the show note links. I wrote an article and I think like 2007 or 08, and I understand that they're lagged, but the article was, does trend falling work on housing or real estate? And it basically showed like these very long, slow periods on real estate. And basically it was like, you started exiting, like you said, 2007 for a lot of these things. But the nice feature is it had you getting back in at some point too. And then you do nothing for like a decade. So had you been a reader of the Meb Faber blog, I think it would have been world beta. Well, the hard part though about what you're saying is, well, and now that we live in a much more financialized world, maybe it's getting easier and easier, but it's not so easy to get out of real estate. Like I still talk to commercial real estate developers all the time. And it's like, if I have a project that has, you know, I get into it in 2006 and it's not going to come to fruition until maybe 09, 10. 
and you're saying get out of the market in 07 it's like what do i do and like that's why i started figuring out these hedges because if you can understand options trading everything you're going to take some basis risk away from you know commercial real estate you may be using s&p as a proxy but that's how you can hedge the risk with like convex put options if done well and professionally and so that's the way, maybe the way to do it because you can't really time the real estate markets if you're working on value add development projects as that liquidity it's the problem you know i thought about this years ago when there used to be didn't there used to be shiller futures on individual markets um, regional so you could yeah. like, regional markets so there was like phoenix seattle denver whatever new york and you could hedge the futures which to me is like a profound innovation that no one was interested in oddly like that's so weird to me I mean, there was even a, a housing up and a housing down ETF, and both of those failed too. But the challenge you mentioned, like the direct hedges is tough. And then even finding the direct hedge, the timing of it, like you mentioned, so trying to figure out what else would actually help you survive. So good news is now you have the answer. So let's hear the conclusion. What We got the diagnosis. What's the prescription? How have you kind of cobbled together some of these concepts into into your uh, hedge portfolio? Because this was the first offering, right? Yeah. So after the bad experience of learning what I didn't know about Options Greeks, and I love that you always talk about the dot-com boom because you and I were both YOLO trading back then. So we can't make fun of people for YOLO trading meme stocks now. And No, we can make fun of them, but we can just say, hey, this was me 20 years ago, young whippersnapper. So... But what I always say is what's great is they're all going to learn about options Greeks. Right now, they've just been delta directionally correct and making money. But then now in the last year, they've had to learn about what the options Greeks mean. So that's why that painful experience in 07 and 08 led me to really learn more about trading options over the subsequent years. And then part of it was I started getting into, I figured out uh, an intermarket spread trade between VIX and S&P in like 2012 and was doing a relative value trade there. So I started learning all of these options trades, all these VIX trades. And so in 2015, I started following all of the other long volatility and tail risk managers in the space and started tracking all of them. And like I said, there's a lot of path dependencies to a, a volatility event or some sort of liquidity crisis. And so I was never comfortable with just allocating to like a single manager or a single strategy. Once again, I believe in ensemble approaches. The other thing that always bothered me is like, in ETFs or 40 act funds, et cetera, like there's just not a lot of options for this kind of stuff. No pun intended. But like I used to love, I mean, for decades, I've been reading your work, Resolve, Alpha Architects, Logical Invest out of Switzerland, all this stuff. And it's like you can create a pretty broadly diversified portfolio using ETFs and mutual funds. But as soon as you start looking for convex hedges like tail risk or long volatility, it's just impossible to stuff those into those products given the regulatory burden. So if that existed, I probably would have never created this fund. So it didn't exist. So we had to figure out something that was a workable solution. So what we figured out is by aggregating all these different path dependencies. And the beautiful thing is if you are an institutional allocator, you can find very niche strategies. And this is what retail doesn't usually have access to these kinds of things. It's like, if I'm an institutional allocator, a pension or endowment, I can find super niche strategies and just allocate whatever percentage I want to that manager and make sure they stick to their knitting and that's all they do. But we don't really have that kind of in the retail space or in the ETF side, so to speak. So I started assessing and tracking all these different managers that do different styles of long volatility and tail risk trading. And then by aggregating an ensemble of them together, it gives me more of a beta signal from that long volatility tail risk. I wish like some of maybe like the Eureka hedge indexes are fraught with all sorts of survivorship bias and all these other shenanigans. But like if some product like that was tradable and packaged into an ETF, it would be a great way to maybe have access to these long volatility and tail risk managers, but it didn't exist. So that's what we created first. And we always had these debates going back to 2018 were we going to launch our total portfolio solution with our cockroach fund first, or were we going to launch this long volatility ensemble first? And Taylor and I decided to do the long volatility ensemble first because it didn't exist. And like that's what people needed most to really hedge their portfolios. So that's why we launched with that one first. Ironically, it took all of 2019 to get all the regulations in place. We started marketing January of 2020 that it was available. We had to aggregate $5 million to get the fund launched. 
We weren't getting any takers. Then March of 2020 happens. Now everybody wants insurance after the flood. So we actually launched the fund April 17th of 2020 for our long volatility ensemble. And like Taylor and I talk about, like this is going to be the hug of death. If we see a V-shaped recovery from here, like we saw, this is going to be really painful for if, if volatility crushes. But otherwise, we're hedged for a second or third leg down. I mean, we're happy to get launched, but it was a inauspicious timing for launching a long volatility fund. Yeah. You know, there's been plenty of strategies, companies that were launched in the depths of recessions or inverse terrible times. We've had a few, certainly. So if you can survive that too, kudos. But the good news is people can see what the full spectrum of outcomes are. You know, I think that's more helpful than anything. All right. So give us a broad 10,000 foot overview of what falls into this category. I know it gets specialized and complicated quick, but for the listeners, what types of funds and strategies make the cut and what doesn't? Yeah, I'll try to kind of define terms and that'll help us from a 30,000 foot view. Classically, I think people talk about tail risk. And the idea with tail risk is you're just buying deep out of the money put options that can really ballast a portfolio in a, in a liquidity event. I think that's what you know historically most people have kind of read about which if they see like maybe just the headlines, that's what like Taleb or Spitzenegel talks about. But the idea of like tail risk is that you buy put options, say with a negative 20% attachment point. So it's kind of like insurance. If the market falls anywhere less than 20%, I don't really make money off of that insurance. If it falls 20% or more, I start to get covered on those put options. And so that's the tail risk convexity options is just rolling puts, just like almost systematically just rolling those puts and saying, great, I've got this attachment point. And the reason I just say negative 20% is that as you've highlighted before, is like usually that's a literature where behaviorally people start to capitulate at like a negative 20% down move in S&P. So the classical forms of tail risk hedging that actually can go back decades or that form of just putting on put options and rolling them, and you're just paying that bleed. So just like insurance, it's going to cost you every year to put on those positions. So the idea is you can hold like 97% long S&P and allocate 3% to these deep out of the money put options that will protect you in case you have a massive liquidity crash. So that's the classic example of tail risk options. When we start talking about long volatility, understandably, people don't have a clear definition of that. The way we like to talk about it or think about it is, when I just said, when you're buying those deep out of the money put options, that's like buying insurance. And you have that every year you're going to bleed waiting for the event to happen if it only comes along like once every decade. The other way you could mitigate that bleed is what we call long volatility, which we believe is just buying options on both tails. So you're buying both puts and calls, but you're doing it opportunistically because you're trying to reduce that bleed. So the easiest analogy is maybe forest fires, right? Like you're looking for you know, when the wind conditions are high, when the underbrush is incredibly dry, when you've been in drought for several years, when the electrical power grid is likely to go down PG&E, like the wires are breaking, you know, when wind speeds increase. When you see all these factors start to pick up on your screening model, then that's maybe the time to put on put options. And the same thing for call options. So you can trade kind of both wings, but you do it in a much more opportunistic fashion because you're trying to reduce that bleed of just rolling those put options like I talked about with tail risk. Now there's trade-offs, right? Like we always like to think about everything as you have carry, certainty, and convexity. And those are the three trade-offs. And you can pick one or two out of three, you never get three out of three. And by carry, I mean just you know positive or negative carry over the life cycle of the options. Certainty is like, how certain are you of the payoff? And then convexity is obviously how convex is that payoff? So you're always giving trade-offs. So when you had just the rolling put options, you have high convexity, high certainty, but negative carry. Now, if you move into long volatility and you're just buying options, but you're doing opportunistically, so you might be in and out of the market, maybe only 40 to 60% of the time, you still have that convexity, but now you're lessening your certainty because you might not be making the right call, but you may be improving the carry of that position. So that's the way to kind of look at those long volatility options. So when we're constructing our book for long volatility, we primarily just want to be buying options. The vast bulk of our portfolio is just in managers that are buying options, those puts or those calls, because you know exactly what your bleed's going to be when you're buying options, but you don't know how large your returns are due to that convexity, but also the monetization heuristics and trying to time those monetizations perfectly. But we love that way of thinking about the world is like, I know what my bleed is, but I don't know what my upside is. Where most people don't know, they might know what their upside is, but they don't know what their downside is. Is this the main target of this US stocks? Great question. So then when you're starting to build out that portfolio is like, we are primarily 
using and attaching to the S&P 500 solely because the bulk of our clients are US based and are attached, you know, with the other parts of our portfolio or, or parts of the portfolio we construct that are attached to the S&P 500. As you know, it's the 600 pound gorilla. So that's what we're primarily attaching to. The problem is you also want to get a little bit away from that. Like, so for example, in, in March, 2020, if you have that implied volatility expand on your options and you need to now protect against the second or third leg down after you monetize them and you're rolling them, you're going to pay up for that implied volatility on those options. Where if you have the ability to kind of search everywhere for convexity, if you can go into rates, FX, commodities, you can probably find some cheaper convexity after you're paying up for that implied volatility on the S&P 500. But by doing that, you're taking basis risk away from the S&P 500 if that's your primary hedge. So we try to incorporate a little bit of both, a sprinkling in a little bit of basis risk around the perimeter. So that way we can find those cheap convexity options around there. That's the primary bucket is just combining this opportunistically buying options on both tails, combining that with some rolling puts. Therefore, the bulk of the portfolio is just buying options. But then, as I said, you have carry convexity certainty is like, okay, behaviorally, if people are unwilling to have that negative bleed of options. And we've seen this a million times, you know, the famous ones, CalPERS, right? Pulling their allocation to, to Spitznagel and Universa right before March, 2020, because for a decade, you've been- My nemesis, CalPERS. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> One of these days, they're going to hire you for those IPAs. I'm off IPAs now. I'm, I'm done with them. I'm convinced they make me feel terrible the next day. Maybe that's my age, my station in life, but I'm now more of a hoppy Pilsner guy. Love my porters if they're not too sweet. Love a lot of the like the Asian beers, but IPA, I'll still drink them. If you give me one, I'm not going to say no, but I will regret it tomorrow. Next time you're up here, I'll have to go over on the roadside in Petaluma. There's a great uh, roadside bar that looks like nothing. It's like a dive bar called Ernie's Tin Bar. And they have the best bars in Northern California, but like best beers. And my favorite is actually this one up here. I don't think you can get it down by you. It's called uh, Moonlight Death and Taxes. And it's a German black lager. So it has like the smells and everything of like a stout, but then it, it's really light like a lager. It's just unbelievably drinkable. Get your first mutiny manager conference hoedown and we'll uh, give me an excuse to come up there. We'll go. I would love to. And by the way, listeners, what Jason's referring to is that I had offered publicly to all these big institutions that I would manage their portfolio for free, buy a bunch of ETFs, rebounce once a year, share a happy hour, some IPAs, and that's it. Because I think most of these are endlessly complex, fee-ridden, way just a hot mess. And CalPERS is like a soap opera watching what they do. Anyway, let's not get off topic. So you put together a lot of these ideas into one. What is the universe for you guys like? There can't be that many of these managers, or are there? Is this the universe like a thousand or is it like a hundred? And I assume they're all private funds for the most part. Like how do you go about cobbling together this group? And are they all slightly crazy? Like I feel like you have to have a screw loose to either be like a short seller or anything that's fighting against the consensus or like running into the wind. Oh yeah. That's basically my days uh, talking to fellow weirdos all the time. Yeah. Because it's like, I always like to say is like, you talked about anybody that you're long volatility when everybody else is short volatility. It doesn't make sense to the average person in public. They're like, why would you do that? Right. You're fighting against those headwinds. And then, you know, an event happens and you actually are able to monetize and your clients treat you like an ATM without a thank you. And then, so you're like, where am I going to get some joy out of this? So you come home and you're such a lunatic to be a long ball person anyway, your significant other is not likely to pat you on the back. They're like, congrats, you did your job. So there's no winning in this game. You can just take the pride of artisanal craftsmanship. So yeah, my daily basis, I'm talking to a bunch of long ball and tail risk managers that are inherently weirdos like you or I. I'll round out. So if you're buying options, that's one thing, but then you behaviorally have this bleed issue. So the way we try to mitigate or manage that is we added vol relative value strategies, where if you're trading that intermarket spread between SPY and VIX, or you're trading calendar spread on VIX, any sort of pairs trade should have some sort of income to it. So we're trying to use some income from those to help cover the cost of the bleed on the option side. And then the third piece we added to it is intraday trend following. So like I said, in March 2020, when that implied volatility expands, you want those Delta One contracts to just short those markets without paying up for implied volatility. So we use intraday trend managers to trade the market indices around the world. So that's kind of like filling out that portfolio. But like to your question is, 
we're invested in 14 managers. We track probably 35 to 40 managers. And that's, I would say, 90 plus percent in the space. Besides, there might be in CTA land sometimes, there might be two guys in a garage somewhere I don't know about, but it's doubtful. So we track all the managers in the space. So how do we put this together? So the other thing is like, I've always been fascinated by the world of CTAs and managed futures. And I wish more people could learn about that space that is a, I'm sure you do as well. But part of it is like the capital efficiencies and the separately managed accounts. And that's what really matters to me. And that's how we were able to construct a product like this is we try to get separately managed accounts from our managers. What that means in practice for people that don't know is they basically have power of attorney to trade your account. And so you get to see the trades in real time. So it helps mitigate any sort of made off effects. Like you get to see all the trades. If somebody was a long ball manager and all of a sudden they went crazy and started trading short ball, you can just pull that money immediately. Who's sort of like the big admin or custodian or where does it sit these days? You have primarily of your FCMs and we use several FCMs from Stonex to ADM to Wedbush. And then your big admins are uh, like Nav, Sudrania, you know, those sorts of admins. And so the idea is if I can get separately managed accounts with these different managers and I hold it at the SCM, it's incredibly capital efficient. And what I mean by that was we only have to post margin and we can cross margin across our managers. And so it's incredibly capital efficient and it's a way to really build a book around capital efficiency where you can have the a lot of offsetting trades that are actually negatively correlated instead of just uncorrelated. And that's how we think about really building the book. Most of it's SMAs, a few commingled funds sprinkled in here, there, but we try to, as much as we can, just get SMAs. This is going to be a hard question because you're probably limited to what you can say, but give me some broad overview. The media loves to, when it hits the fan, loves to like be like, oh, like here's a tail risk manager. They were up 75,000% this month. And then just like consistently you read these and you're like, like literally like what in the world is this journalist writing about? Because they have no idea what they're talking about. And I feel like it's obviously wrong, but misleading and unfortunate because these strategies, I think, very much have a home. What are your kind of broad expectations for a strategy similar to what you are doing? You know, if the S&P is down 20 in September of 2022, is it something you're hoping like this is going to be up 20, 100, up 2? I know it depends, but... Yeah, I can answer it in a way that, as you know, like these are always tough from a compliance perspective, these questions. But I do want to touch on the one hard question because it's going to make my brain explode was this terrible reporting about funds being up, you know, four or five thousand percent in March of 2020. And that's just completely erroneous reporting. As you and I know, what they were basing that on is the premium spent either that month or that quarter on those options. And that premium was up four or five thousand percent. But the actual book, when it's combined with both the long stock positions and the hedge positions, the book was flat. So it wasn't like these managers were up 4,000 or 5,000 or 7,000 percent. It was actually the premium spent. So if you were going to report that, you should have said for every month and every quarter for the prior 11 years before that, they were down 100 percent. Every month. Right. But the weird juxtaposition, like if you're a manager, you're like, well, I'm not going to correct them. You know, if they want to write about me being up 4,000 percent, 40,000 percent, good for them. Like, I'm not going to say anything. It maybe showed up in like... Three days later in the journal, like a tiny byline. By the way, we didn't mean 40,000%. Okay. And obviously did its job because I've gotten that question like hundreds of times. So going back to your question, like, how do you think about this protection? So that's obviously the hardest piece in the sense that, like I was saying, with options, you know what your bleed is, but you don't know what your return is going to be because you, it always going to matter the path dependency of sell-off. Like what vol level are we coming from? How sharp is the sell-off? What's the time horizon in the sell-off? combined with what was the duration or tenor of your options, you know, as you know, there's so many factors involved that it's hard to get an idea. So what you try to do is you run shock tests based on all these different scenarios, but then, you know, shock tests like everything are kind of putting your finger up in the air and, and kind of hoping for the best. More importantly, even the harder part with these, on like I was saying, that convexity, I really want to stress the monetization heuristics. Because like you're saying, if you're up 4,000%, if you don't monetize there, it's going to mean revert but down to like 2,000% on that premium or up to 8,000%. So you never know, are you monetizing right into the bulk of that move or could it run to a second or third leg down? You never know. So the whole point is like, you, this is why I believe in ensemble approaches. You want these all these overlaying and overlapping monetization heuristics. So this is why we're in 14 managers because I want people that do very different path dependencies, but also monetize differently to make sure we capture that move. Because like we're saying, if it happens once every 10 years, we need to make sure we monetize that as best we can. So we may not monetize it perfectly, but across the ensemble, we'll do well. 
the way we try to talk about clients and the way we construct our portfolio is the idea is when you're doing these sort of options or long volatility or tail risk trades, is anything less than a negative 10% move in the S&P is just noise. If you try to really hedge perfectly one for one against that, the bleed is going to be so high, it's not going to really work for you. Unless like maybe you could rebalance daily or intraday, it might work that way. But otherwise, the bleed on those at the money or close to the money options are going to be way too expensive. So what we try to do is we try to, once again, work behaviorally this negative 20% attachment point. If we've constructed our ensemble well, it would hopefully start to have that getting in close to that one for one coverage around a negative 20% move in the S&P, depending on once again on the path dependencies of varied move and all the things we've talked about is because of that behavioral issue, that's where we want to see it pick up. And then because of those convexity and options, they go from like worth nothing, worth nothing, worth nothing to exploding when you're starting to get in that negative 20% attachment point. But then as soon as you start to move to negative 40, negative 50, negative 60% down in the S&P, the convexity is going to really kick in and your portfolio could be up 70, 80, 100. Like it should have some convexity to it. So there's kind of an arc of that return profile. So when you're building a portfolio like ours, those are the heuristics that you're trying to roughly cover. Whether you can do it in reality is a different story. And maybe we'll get into kind of like what's happened this year and why a lot of people aren't doing well this year, like especially as we have those drawdowns. Yeah. Let's go ahead and get to it this year. I got a couple of follow-up questions on this, but 2022... What's the sitch? So this is also why I believe in ensemble approach. So we have across our portfolio, trying to think what I could say. We have managers that are up quite large and we have managers that are down quite large. So the dispersion in 2022 has been enormous depending on what your trading strategy style is. But even if we look at like VXTH, which is long S&P and then buying 30 Delta calls on VIX, I believe it's down about 18% on the year. And then P put, which is long SPY and then negative 5% put options on the S&P is down about 14% on the year. So they're both down more than the S&P is down. And that's supposed to be the idea of those indices is that, that you would actually have coverage there. So what can happen is when you have these slow grind downs, like we've seen this year, and you don't really see that spike in realized volatility over implied it's really hard for a lot of these managers to make money depending on what their strategy is. But other strategies that have done really well is looking at cross-asset volatility. We talked about before, if you want to get a little bit of basis away from the S&P and trading you know, currency vol, rates vol, fixed income vol, those things have been doing really well this year. Other trades like dispersion trades, gamma scalping that have a little bit of a restriking component to them, those have done really well. But your classical tail risk or long volatility trades have really struggled in an environment like this. I mean, I think about the, and this is when we when we talk about the cockroach, the idea of like having that total portfolio solution is long volatility and tail risk are really great for liquidity events like March of 2020. When you have those correlations go to one, you really want that structurally negative one correlated trade to have complexity to it. But if you have these more slower drawdowns like we've seen this year or maybe even 2008, these are things that sometimes you want like CTA trend fo- commodity trend following for. Those are going to do well. So that's why we have those in our book too, because we try to think about all the different path dependencies, not just in vol space. But to give the audience maybe a quick rough heuristic, when you're looking at the VIX index, that spot VIX index is untradeable. And what really is tradable is it has a term structure to it with the VIX futures or with options around that. But what spot VIX is telling you is the forward expected variance over the next month. And I say variance because it can be to the upside or downside, even though calling it the fear index and volatility is a bit misleading. It's just forward expected variance. So if the VIX is at like a 32, the rough heuristics is a rule of 16, is to expect then a 2% daily move if the VIX is at 32. That's what the expected forward volatility or variance looks like. So if you have a day where the market tanks off, it's down 1.8%, but the expectation was 2%, you're still within expectations. You can actually have vol come in when you think the market's selling off. And I think this is where it starts to get tricky for people because during those long risk on cycles, VIX is very low. And as soon as you have any sort of down move in the S&P, we really see a spike in volatility. And so people think then that it's negatively correlated and it's just for those down moves where it's really variance to the upside or downside. And it's based on, as everything in life, what are the expectations? Did expect expectations come in higher or lower? So throughout this year, we've had a medium-sized VIX. And so therefore, the expectations have been you know, fairly mid-range. And this drawdown has been within that range. So every day that is bleeding or dripping down lower, it's within that range. So you're not going to see a spike in volatility. 
And then the second part of that is, I'm not to get too in the weeds, but the idea is the VIX index is what we call floating strike volatility, where everybody buys fixed strike volatility. So I'll give a just a rough heuristic example is let's say the VIX is at 10 and I'm buying a negative 5% out of the money put, but I had to pay up 15 for my volatility on that position. So, okay. So everybody goes, okay, VIX is at 10. And then we walk forward in time. And let's say two weeks from now, we've drifted down towards that negative 5% towards my strike, right? And VIX, spot VIX, because it's floating strike VIX has gone from 10 to 14. And you go, well, the VIX index is up 40%. And you go, not so fast. I paid 15 on for my volatility on that put. And now it's at 14. So I'm actually down 6.7% because that's what fixed strike is. I paid for this. It's come down to my strike, but it's really based on what I paid for that. So with a higher volatility we've seen that's priced into these options this year, this is what the headwinds are when you're buying put options in this kind of environment is even though people are looking at spot VIX and that VIX index, which is untradeable, that floating strike versus fixed strike is what are you actually paying? And then are expectations higher or lower? So as you think about, you mentioned 2022 being pretty across the board with some of these strategies. How do you think about position sizing the various strategies and managers? Is it kind of a back of the envelope? Look, we want to have 20% in these four categories and we'll rebalance when we feel like it. Is it more complicated than that? How do you kind of put that recipe together? Yeah, it's twofold. So when we're looking at just the buying options, I look at the path of moneyness. So I want to have everything from at the money to out of the money to deep out of the money. So I'm trying to cover a lot of those paths of moneyness as we start that convexity starts to kick in. And then within those path of moneyness, we may be overlaying strategies with different monetization heuristics or slightly different wrinkles to their strategy to make sure we can cover it. And that's the bulk of our portfolio. So when we're actually position sizing those, it's thinking about that path of moneyness as the S&P starts to sell off and we want to cover and overlay and overlap that path. But then when we add in these things like uh, vol relative value or vol arbitrage, and then the intraday trend following on the short future side, we start risk weighting them based on our own internal metrics. But it's very similar to like uh, ulcer index or what's the serenity index is the latest one where we're, we're more looking at downside, right? We're looking at like Sortino ratios. We're looking at downside vol max drawdown, duration of drawdown, we risk weight our managers based on that, on those sides, because you can have better kind of data on that where you need the path dependency on the option side. So it's, you're using a little bit of both heuristics, but I'm curious that your take is like, what I always argue is like, we may be attenuating those based on all those risk metrics, but over a long arc of history, it always almost comes down to one over N. I mean, obviously the volatility and drawdown is going to factor into there, but over a long arc of history, it's easy to almost argue one over N. Let's say you had you know, 50% in five different vol arb managers or vol relative value. You could argue just allocate 10% to each and rebalance because over time, it's going to kind of equal out. What tends to be the reason, and you, know, you may not have full enough history for this to be that relevant a question, but when you give people the boot, what tends to be the reason why? Is there not following the rules, getting divorced? Yeah. So this is the hardest question I think there is. Buying Dogecoin. Exactly. So it would be super easy, like I was saying, with the SMAs and everything to see their trades in real time. The easiest answer, everybody goes, oh, when they don't stick to their knitting and get away. So like if you have a long vol manager and they start trading short vol options, obviously kick them out. Like that's an easy cut, right? The other hard problem though, that is actually even harder than that is what happens if they're in drawdown and they're exceeding their max drawdown previously? Is the strategy broken? Is the manager broken or is it just out of vogue given the path dependency of the sell-off? I think those things are kind of impossible to manage. The other ones that are just kind of outside the box that we've had to deal with is if a manager's in drawdown and their largest clients start redeeming, they might just go out of business. And so then we have to look for replacing them. This is why, by the way, we follow 30 to 40 managers and I built an ensemble approach with Lego pieces because it's easy to replace those kind of Legos as people move in and out. And then the only other thing that maybe is a little bit nebulous as well, is if they trade a particular strategy and this environment has been really good for that strategy and they are doing poorly, like beyond what expected, like then that would be a way to really reassess of whether you want this manager in the portfolio. So I think this is one of the hardest questions and everybody's easy answer is always like, oh, when they go rogue and don't say like, yeah, that's an easy fire. The hard part is like, as you know, it's like, 
when people are struggling for years on end is like, do you cut them? Or now you're also, it, most of our managers have high watermarks. So now you're also crystallizing those losses in a way. So somebody calls you up, they're like, look, I got 60, 40. How should I think about position sizing this allocation to this strategy? So this is always, as you know, this is the number one question. And I always like to say, don't necessarily listen to what I say, watch what I do. And so when we constructed a portfolio at a very high level, we're combining equal amounts of offensive and defensive assets. So, you know, if 60, 40, we view as offensive, we need an equal amount of defensive assets. And the reason I say that is because these risk on assets like uh, 60, 40 stocks and bonds is they have huge left tails to them. They have a huge left skew. So for you know decade, they might be making single digit or double digit returns, but then also you experience like a 50 to 80% drawdown. That's a huge amount of left tail. And to put a bow on that comment, you know, we did a poll. Listeners, every time I say that, you should have to drink. We did a poll <laughs> yeah. and the poll was, you know, what do you think the max drawdown on 6040 real after inflation was? And you know, everyone gets it wrong. They're like 10 to 20%. I think that was even during a like 14% drawdown. People are like 20%. And the answer was, I think, over 50. I think in the 1930s, it would have been 60. I've seen 63 and 67%, but that was nominal, maybe not real. Yeah, two thirds. I mean, there, there's an old, I think, comment I used to make, which is like, you can't find a country in the world. There's maybe one that hasn't had a two thirds drawdown for 60, 40 real at some point. And maybe it's Switzerland. There's, there was like one that was, I think, like 50, but it's not 20 is the point. And so I think a year like this year surprises a lot of people, not listeners of this show or yours, but other shows, it surprises a lot of people. So tell me, how much do they buy? So then the combination of those offensive and defense, like I just said, offense has that huge left tail. Your defensive constructor right has a huge right tail or right skew to it. This is why we want to pair those together. And so the idea that, watch what we do, not necessarily what you say is like, we're combining equal amounts of offense and defense. And then below that, we use that Harry Brown four quadrant model. So if I have 25% stocks, 25% bonds, I believe we allocate 25% to long volatility and tail risk and 25% to commodity trend advisors. We also hold a little bit of gold and cryptocurrency for that like fiat hedge, but that's the way we construct the portfolio. Now, a lot of people are not going to like that, as you know, because it's reducing that exposure to 60-40, that 25% each kind of model. And so a lot of people worry about that defensive side, reducing their offensive side. But what we can do, and this is why we build it as a commodity pool operator using managed futures and options, is it allows us that unbelievable capital efficiency and that cross margin ability where we can kind of be offsetting these positions. So it's a lot easier for us to in-house apply some of that implicit leverage you get with futures and options contracts. Now, I, hopefully you'll push back to me on leverage, but the idea is in-house, what we do then is we're running 50% global stocks, 50% global bonds, 50% our long volatility ensemble, 50% our commodity trend ensemble, and then we run 20% of the gold and cryptocurrencies positions. So our total exposure is about 220% or 2.2x. This is for cockroach? Yeah. Okay. But let's say theoretically someone is like targeting just for the long vault strategy fund, hedge fund. If someone came to you with 60-40, it says, look, I want to replace part of my current portfolio. I'm old. I'm not changing my ways now. I'm not adding gold. I'm not adding other things. I just want, I want you guys help me out here. How much should I give you? Is it like 10%? From what I just said with the four quadrant models, like, okay, half your portfolio should be 60, 40, and then I'd be 25% in long ball. And I'd be 25% in commodity trend managers because you need the commodity trend to offset the bond side and you want the long ball to offset the stock side. Okay. So they're going to give you half their portfolio. I like it. You just upsold everyone on the listeners. No, I think that makes sense. You know, and, and so many people reach out to me when they talk about something like, you know, the CTA and the trend. And they're always asking, despite me 100% of the time saying, I can't recommend funds. They say, what do you think about these funds? And I say, you should buy multiple because that gets you away from the binary stress of being like, why is AQR doing amazing or terrible? Why is this ETF doing amazing or terrible? I feel like, because most people will actually secretly want to gamble like they don't actually want the correct answer, which would be to buy six of them and just move on. They actually like the concept of perfectly picking like the right choice. Tell me when to be in and out of stocks. 
it's ego destroying. Like to actually admit that you don't know the way you and I do and build ensemble approaches is it's ego destroying where we all want the hero trade. We want to be able to tell our golfing or fishing buddies or at a group dinner how great we're doing, but we don't talk about our losses. And that's the way I think that ensemble, like you said, everybody really does actually want to bet because they want to be a hero. And to admit you can't predict the future and to broadly diversify is absolutely ego destroying. And that's why I don't think people do it. But also you kind of set me up in the way about what percentages I do, because there's two ways to look at that is like, if I'm talking to like a financial advisor and I'm saying, give me half your portfolio, as you know, that doesn't really work. But if I say, give me 10% of your portfolio, they're going to give me that 10% and then they're going to forget about me and I can clip that coupon indefinitely. So that's a good business decision. But if I'm honest, it's not a good ballast to the portfolio. It's not going to be enough to really help you out when these liquidity events happen. So I'm stuck in that conundrum of like, look, this is what we build. This is what I believe in versus what's a good business decision. And so that's the other thing is people always want to give like a tiny allocation to these strategies. Like I, once again, everybody's got a drink because another one of your Twitter polls is like how many people are allocated to commodities or commodity trend followers. It's always like less than 10%. And what do you think that's really going to do to your portfolio? Way yeah. less. It's something to talk about. There should be a show that's just like the lie detector. Like you ask some of these people like real answer versus what you do. And the real answer is like, look, business career risk. I want to be close to the mainstream because I'm going to get fired if I'm too far from the mainstream. But I'll add these things that will probably help. But I'll be honest and know that I don't own enough of them. But if I own too much, I'll probably get fired. So like there's some sort of like career efficient frontier of advisors, you know, that want to do the right things, but want to stay employed as well. So there's one thing, uh, sorry to cut you off. There's one thing I do, I do want to address about this portfolio construction and the capital efficiency and using leverage. You know, everybody likes to run away from leverage, but if, as long as you combine uncorrelated and negatively correlated assets, you can have a prudent use of leverage to make the returns a bit sexier. And cause that's what people don't want, you know, in the cash basis of like permanent portfolios or portfolios like that, that you've shown in the past on a cash basis, you know, they may clip along at four to 5% real over decades, which people should be happy about because they're outpacing inflation with their savings. So they should be happy, but they want sexier stuff as we talked about. The way we think about it is like everybody goes, okay, in the 2010s, commodity trend followers didn't do well or whatever. And I go, okay, but you know, depending on what index you look at, they may have carried at like 2% Kager over that time frame. And I'm like, if I can stack those in with the rest of my portfolio, then that's fantastic. So the idea is like, if I can take 50% exposure to global stocks, 50% exposure to global bonds, and 50% exposure to each long volatility commodity trend. The idea is, as long as that ensemble can carry as close to flat during risk on times, and then when risk off happens and they jump out from behind the curtain and really ballast and save your portfolio, and then you can be rebalancing into stocks and bonds at a lower NAB point, so you compound more effectively or efficiently, that's the way to be using these in a portfolio. And I don't think people really think about that as often as like, you said, the performance chasing, but it's really like, okay, what's the emergent property or the aggregate effects of my portfolio, no matter what kind of macro environment I'm in over the next decade, and I can rebalance between these things. And I don't care if, say, commodity trend managers are carrying flat to slightly positive, but then in 2020, they jump out from behind the curtain. And the last 11, 10, 11, 12 months have been fantastic for those portfolios. And even when, let's say, long volatility or tail risk has struggled, like you need this broad diversification. The people that reach out to you, so they listen to the Med Faber show. Yeah. They reach out to you and they say, okay, but I just want the hedge my traditional book side. What percent are interested in risk reduction and what percent are interested in, all right, this is going to let me get even weirder. Now that I cover my bases more, I'm 2006 buck. I'm just going to buy three more properties. Now that I have this hedge, I'm going to get even weirder. My guess would be it'd be like 80%, 90% risk reduction. Yeah. So- you're pretty much right. Like basically the other thing is like the people coming into us, it's this weird issue of like, if you haven't read like a Taleb book, a Spitzenegel book, or listened to you forever, or read Chris Colt's white papers, the idea that you're going to get what we do is not possible. Like I'm not going to convince anybody sui generis that they should invest in us. So like we are just trying to find weirdos like us. And so that's only the people we go after or that come to us, like looking for like water in a desert that want products like we build. So that's part of it. And most people, like you said, are looking for risk reduction. I started this conversation now or end this conversation with like the idea is like, 
to me, it is an entrepreneurial hedge. You can get a lot weirder with what you're doing entrepreneurially or what you're investing in privately. And so that's really exciting to me. But like, I think you nailed it. It's probably like less than 5%, I would say, that really get looking at their life and their portfolio and their businesses holistically and thinking about hedging those. So that way they can be much more aggressive. Because like, imagine 2008, 2007, 2008 happens. And now you have cash is worth much more than cash was worth in 2005, right? Not only do you have a convex cash position, but now cash is incredibly value, right? You can make payroll. You can buy out your competitors for pennies on the dollar. You can buy real estate for pennies on the dollar. Those things are incredibly valuable. And it's really valuable to an entrepreneur or a business owner. I got a lot to say. One thing was, I mean, the people that drive me craziest are the VCs who should absolutely know better about the business cycle and consistently get upside down when things turn. And so this year, as the valuations had receded, and I'm like, your entire business should be anti-cyclical. Most of the money to work in the bad times when valuations are low and no one's interested in all the incubators are cutting their numbers and people are cutting their, like it's the exact opposite of what they do. And it's, it drives me nuts. You should be going crazy happy right now that all your competitors are like, whoa, things are going crazy. I'm going to stop investing. Got to cut my deal. No, it should be the opposite. On that point, our mutual homie, Rodrigo Gordillo at, at Resolve used to always tell me, he's like, you got to be crushing it out there in the Bay Area with VCs to buy like your long volatility product. I'm like, have you ever met a VC? They're never going to hedge. They're like, it's just not going to happen. But like, to your point is like, what people really don't miss, not only do you need to be counter cyclical, but if you can take a liquid portfolio and you're overlaying it with these illiquid privates and you actually have a convex cash position, actually when you need it most, when you need that dry powder, when you're having capital calls or you can buy up, you know, counter cyclically, these business or make investments at a lower point is like, these things are incredibly powerful together, but I don't think people really think about that. You're an entrepreneur. I'm going to give you two ideas. You ready? One is you should just do that, by the way. You should drive down to San Francisco and go knock on. I have a tweet from January where I say, I always wonder why my VCPE friends never hedge their holdings. Like it's the most autocorrelated cyclical like business because Dave McClure, famous VC, he goes, there's a lot of VC inside baseball and what's going on with startup valuations and short VCs are shitting their pants over existing portfolios while salivating over potentially more reasonable valuations. He called it a big fucking messy dump, which was my favorite quote of 2022. But I was like, why don't you guys ever hedge? Like, it makes no sense to me. And he said, it's rather difficult to hedge startup positions, which is, I don't think is true. Actually, I think you on aggregate, you basically get leverage NASDAQ or ARC. But he says, most VCs don't have enough cash sitting around to hedge. And so I'm like, whoa, first of all, if, you, if you're a VC and you don't have any cash, you're a terrible VC, one. And two, learn about capital efficiency with Jason Mutiny. Anyway, and then he says, and don't have a mandate to short public stocks via their fund or prohibited from it. And I was like, yo, bro. But this is every VC. Like, I do not, on the Venn diagram of VCs and trend following and managed futures or even hedging, I think there are zero people that exist in the middle. I know of one, but I think he doesn't do it anymore. I think he's like... This is too costly. Trend following isn't as good as my VCing. So I'm going to get out of this. Whoever figures it out can outcompete everybody. Because like you said, you have leveraged long beta, which is fantastic. And you combine it with capital efficient, like deep out of the money puts or something like that. And then you rebalance, like you could out dominate those partners, but you would have to do it over multiple business cycles. And none of them think about over multiple business cycles. They're just trying to clip that, that coupon and the illiquid private. Like I even say, you know, imagine if Buffett, Ed used some maybe tail risk hedging on Berkshire Hathaway. I mean, he's had drawdowns of like 55%. You imagine what his compounding would be if he reduced the left tail, if he reduced that volatility tax. But nobody seems to really think about these things. And to me, it's like- He's an option seller. He's not an option buyer. He's an option seller, dude. Although at his age, he should be an option buyer, not seller. Here's the second idea for you. So first idea- market to the VCs. Give me a touch with your boy, J-Cal. Let's make it work. And by the way, as far as I'm concerned, this conversation, I'm talking to a VC right now. I know you're going to pretend you're not, but you're an angel investor. So he started a new website to track his public market trades. And he says, I want to be a great public market investor. And then he said, I wanted to 5X my money in the next 10 years. And I was like, J-Cal, hold on a second. That's like 18% a year. Lofty goal, by the way, but good luck. 
I think that's a big idea. The first idea is get all the leveraged equity bros to do something else with their portfolio because they don't. Two is, and Tiger is a good example. I think they were down like 50 or 60% this year. Just some insane number. Marcus not even down that much. Anyway, idea two, and this is an enormous idea, corporate treasury. 99.999% of corporate treasuries just put their money in cash and T-bills. And you and I both know on a nominal basis, okay, in a world of four, six, eight percent inflation, you're losing a ton of money in their lower volatility, lower drawdown choices. We should, we should write a paper on this. The only thing people do with treasury other than that is crypto, right? So, which is an even worse idea. You know, we've stated publicly many times, half our balance sheet is in Trinity strategies and half is in tail risk type of strategies. There's a lot of permutations you could do, but I think that's an idea that has unlimited scale. Now, talk about a tough challenge, right? No one's going to get fired for T-bills and Bank of America account yielding 0.05%. But I couldn't agree with you more. I wish we didn't agree this much, but like you'll you'll be shocked. I even took that to the nth level. Is I've actually been talking to a lot of people that run DAOs or on like the board of a DAO or whatever about, you know, why would you use, you know, cryptos as your stables or stable coins and everything? I was like, you want to like a broadly diversified basket of the world's assets, and that would be your for your treasury. Like that you should be using that for your treasury instead of that. And then I've talked to actual corporates and entrepreneurs, like you're just saying, like run your treasury and where where I think you and I agree way too much is that the idea is like, if you had a broadly diversified pa basket of all the world's asset classes and you rebalance frequently, you can, as you know, looking at the broad history of these things, you can actually delever it. Like choose, choose your own adventure. Like the idea is if you do it well or extremely well, you should probably get down to like a 5% like real return with maybe six to 7% vol and maybe a seven to 8% drawdown. Like you can delever it down to that. So if you had your corporate treasury, that's truly ticking along. Like the way I try to say it for everyday people is I'm so tired of us talking about investments when they're really savings. And you need your savings to be there when you need them most. People call them investments because then you think you can make so much money off them, you can retire early. No, it's savings. You need to save more. You need to manage your savings for no matter what can come. And you need your savings to reduce the drawdowns of the volatility so they'll be there when you need them most. So as long as your savings outpace inflation, that's the only thing you should care about. And by holding all the world's asset classes, you don't need to debate about CPI or core PCE or any of that stuff. Your whole basket is really the inflation basket. And then you can attenuate, like we're talking about, with leverage. You can either deleverage or add leverage, and you can choose whatever adventure you want. And especially if you're putting that in corporate treasury, that's how you can have a sustainable corporate treasury that's not floating around so much. And once again, they're going to have to drink because one of your polls, even about how much T-bills or cash have lost at any given time horizon, people are just shocked by that because you need other things in your portfolio that can even ballast out the cash position. Roading effects of inflation, anything that just gets kind of skimmed off, people don't really notice, you know, um, the same thing with our world of fees, you know, it's a great construct because you don't really see it. What don't we agree on? You say we agree on a lot. What are some things that we don't agree on? I think there would be things because you brought up fees. I think that you would disagree with like an expensive product that ours that's like layers of fees on fees. But to me, it's always about what is your net after fees and what's comparable relative value, what else you could buy. It's really that simple to me. I think everybody talks about fees a lot as they should, and everybody's gotten the low fee mantra, but it's always about what's my net return compared to unit of drawdown risk. And that's what matters to me more. And I wish we could stuff our products into low fee products. It just doesn't work like that. And you and I could talk for another three hours about the regulatory burden of trying to do that. When are we going to launch the uh, cockroach portfolio? There are some certainly non-safe for work for tickers we could do for that. Do you think the SEC will? <laughs> <laughs> We've talked about that. Do you go the, the first half or the second half of that work? Either one is uninvestable. I think about vehicles all the time, right? And like I said, if we can't stuff it into an ETF, could maybe stuff it into an interval mutual fund, but then you're losing some of the tax advantages you get from ETF. The other one, because I brought up Buffett earlier, is like, I really think like the 70s style conglomerate in a publicly traded equity, where then you are just internally hedging would be a very interesting model because then, you know, non-accredited can invest in it. I had said a while back, I was like, I don't understand because the Bitcoin ETFs can't get to market. This was pre sailor I was like, I don't understand why someone wouldn't just acquire some shell or a company 
and then just buy a boat ton of Bitcoin. I was like, you want to make that trade there. You now have spot Bitcoin and then he's done it. So whatever. But it's always interesting, the structures and what is the best. A bunch of the hedge funders try to do a similar version as Buffett. Greenlight has one. I think Third Point has one where they're trying to do the reinsurance float. And then I think I've also partially realized reinsurance is a harder business than they may have thought. <laughs> it's like, wow, you just get, you get all this magic insurance float. And then we're like, oh, wait, we actually have to write good premiums and stuff. So, But it goes back to what, I mean, you and I have been texting about this for years, but the idea was like, you're always looking like, how do we find that permanent capital? Because like you said, if it if people need 10, 20 years to really assess a portfolio or different parts of the portfolio, it's like, how do you find that permanent capital? And I think you had a lot of interesting things that almost like reverse penalties where if you get out within like less than 10 years, you have to pay the other people in the fund. Like there's all those kind of liquidity preferences. But the one I've always thought was interesting is like, if you did it in a publicly traded equity kind of structure, and then you can start talking about different ways that if people can use prudent capital efficiency, if they're on like interactive brokers or something and they have portfolio margin, they could actually structure their whole life around that where the nominal or notional value of that portfolio takes along and they can borrow against it to buy houses or buy cars, pay themselves back with interest, not have those liquidity events as we find with like the billionaires dues to get equity out of their business without having tax consequences. I mean, look, I, I give a lot of the robo advisors well-deserved crap for some of their practices. And a lot of them are pretty good, but they certainly do some cool things on occasion. But one of the things they did was the low-cost line of credit, you know, so you could borrow against the portfolio. And any brokerage, particularly when you have enough money, allows you to do that, which the rich certainly take advantage of, as they should. Interesting. So, I, you know, I think an interval fund, if you were to come up with an interval fund and say, look, it doesn't have to be an interval fund. It could be a regular fund, but with penalties for withdrawals. So it's basically an interval fund by name, same sort of, you ha you're you forced to have a long-term perspective. So you could invest in some illiquid things that you couldn't necessarily, has to be publicly tradable daily, I think is probably a, a great idea. But the part of that though is, uh, Corey always likes to argue, maybe the grass is always greener on the other side. So, but I'm curious, your take is like, so we have, you know, we're private placement, you know, and so you have to go through that whole PPM process, which is like, you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat to really onboard and everything like that. But it can also create sticky capital on the backside. Whereas if you have an ETF or mutual fund, people, it, you're like, I want to be able to hit the buy button coming in, but you're you're not talking about hitting the sell button going out and not knowing your customer. So I think there's there's advantages and disadvantages to both that like you and Corey deal with. Well, tough on the interval fund. You can limit that though. You you yeah you can get like ten percent liquidity a quarter or yep. something. But the way that I want to do it is even better, which is you're not limited to withdrawal. You get dinged with a huge fee if you try to withdraw in years one, two, three, four, five. But I like the idea of that fee not going to the manager but going to the shareholders. So you get a little bit of carrot and stick both. Anyway. Jerry Hayworth at 36 South does that. They have like a liquidity preference that goes back to the fund holders because they're trading like long-term ISDA contracts and everything. So I don't know that. Let me look that up later. That's cool. But it's not a private stuff, yeah. I like it. What else are you thinking about on the horizon? We got to keep you for a few more minutes. Uh, anything on your brain that you're like, we haven't talked about that, you know, could be watch businesses. It could be other ideas, screwy ideas you have. Anything on the brain or things you're worried about? Yeah, I always have, well, I have tons of screwy ideas and I always worry about everything because I'm a long ball guy at heart. But one of the ones I always think about that we're always working towards is Cockroach 2.0, which is combining all of these liquid asset portfolios with the illiquid privates. And I absolutely love and have followed religiously like everything you've done from being an angel investor through the syndicates on AngelList, through your own investments and everything. It's like combining those two, that's to me is the future that we're working towards and like trying to figure out how to construct that portfolio. So you have both the illiquid and illiquid can feed each other in this symbiotic way that makes both of them so much better. So that's one of the things I'm thinking about. Fresh on my brain, I, I hate to be topical, but like this whole OFAC ruling on tornado cash and crypto may just destroy DeFi. What are you talking about for the listeners? So the Office of Foreign Control is basically decided that like tumblers like tornado cash were maybe working with North Koreans. And so therefore, you know, you can be a designated bad actor and then you basically cannot use any off ramps. So then if they start applying that to even other DeFi protocols like Aave or Uniswap, and then you've ever used those at some point, you may not be able to get your cash back from on-chain to off-chain. 
And so this could destroy the whole kind of DeFi uh, ecosystem. I know this isn't necessarily a crypto show, but like it is an asset class as you and I talked about that should be in your portfolio at a percentage of the world asset portfolio. This is always amazing to me. People want to always argue that hero trade. Like you said, they want to argue the thesis for or against. I don't care. Tell me what position size you're going to use and what's the rest of your portfolio look like in aggregate. Those are the only two things that matter. The arguments for or against crypto are kind of just pointless, but that's what people like to talk about because everybody wants to put their ego on the table and show everybody what they know and what they don't know. And everybody wants that wants to be optimistic or pessimistic. But you, I mean, you've done this so well is like, just if that's one of the world's asset classes, you got to hold it in that position and that, you know, percentage, and then you rebalance. It's a trading sardine. Trading sardine. Most memorable trade. You got one we talked about already. Oh man, I knew you were going to ask this and then I didn't think about it at all. While you think about it, I think the name, the 2.0 cockroach, we should have as the mascot, the water bear or moss piglet. Do you know what that is? Yeah, I know um, exactly I can never pronounce the actual tardigrades. I can't pronounce the actual, the actual bug, but they're very cute. Yeah, I've seen those, those t-shirts and everything. They're great. By the way, and I know you've had fellow podcast guests like Dylan Grice. And I think maybe a decade ago, he wrote about like cash growth portfolios, ideas. And, and quite frankly, it's it's very similar to permanent portfolio and like Book Stauber wrote stuff. What was interesting, and I, I know you'll love this because you're great about naming conventions, is actually our internal working name for a long time was Kraken, you know, s- sticking with this kind of mutiny seafaring theme. And then one day I had the epiphany that Cockroach is evocative of exactly what we want to do. And then found out later, like after we launched Cockroach Fund about like uh, Dylan's and, and Book Stauber's um, kind of essays. But what's interesting is like, Everybody told us not to name it that. They told us it was a terrible name and we shouldn't go with it. And I'm like, do you remember it? Like, that's all that matters. Because in our industry, everybody's got these three letter acronyms that nobody can remember. And it's interesting in hindsight, like everybody told us not to name it, but like it's evoking exactly what we wanted to do. You can't kill it. You know, we're trying to manage multi-generational wealth. Sorry, I I derailed us from your your question about memorable trade. I've had some really weird ones, but I'm going to try to think memorable and I'll try to so the, some of the more weird ones were like, I used to do actually at when I was at IMG Academy, I used to do all like the homework for all my tennis professionals. So I could get all their gear. So I was just kitted out like Adidas, Puma, Nike, head to toe. That was one of the best trades I've done. And there was things like when I lived in Brazil, like there's the shadow market. So you could kind of triangulate the FX swap. And I was making decent money in Brazil doing that. But memorable though, if I stick to the literal definition of memorable, it goes back to that 2007, 2008. Obviously that's what I built my whole life around at this point. But the idea of like calling the housing crash and buying put options against the like countrywide of the world and losing money, like there's nothing more memorable than that because it's also put me on this 12 year journey to bring like these kind of products to the market. So, I mean, I hate to be lame and repeat myself. Yeah. There's a version of you that's just like super rich in Charleston and weighs 300 pounds and is unhappy. And, you know, like you, uh, you didn't learn anything and you're just kind of an asshole. And I like this version of you so much more, but we'll never know except in the metaverse. That's one of those where you just like look at the heavens and be like, who is cursing me here on this scenario that this possibly happened, but lesson learned, you won't forget that scar anytime soon. I did run in mind while we're still, hopefully this stays in and on air, but like one of these times when we're visiting each other, especially if I'm down there, I want to hang out with your wife too, because she was a philosophy major, right? So her and I could just navel gaze for hours on end talking about Heidegger and stuff. So That's my favorite type of dinner. I can just sit back and drink my, not an IPA and just reminisce. But in fairness, I think what both you and I do is a form of praxis, right? We both have a personal philosophy of how we view the world, and then we build products around it. So it's philosophy and praxis. It's praxis. I mean, like that's what we do. So we can try to pretend we're not philosophers, but like you either like our philosophy or you don't, and that's what we do. Yeah, we're, we're both eventually just turning into fortune cookies. On yep. that note, Jason, had a blast today. We need This has been way too long and coming, and we need to do this more often. But uh, for the listeners, where do they go? You can find us at uh, mutinyfund.com where my partner Taylor does all sorts of great essays and all of our media. And then I'm at Jason Mutiny on Twitter. Thanks so much for joining us today, bud. Thank you. Appreciate it.